we are like really pushing the limits of Michelle. I think I want to be good. I don't want to get in trouble yeah. with Nicole. Nicole has a sword. I don't know if you've seen pictures of Nicole's sword, Jamie, <laughs> but she has a large sword. <laughs> And welcome to the inaugural season three episode of Miss Shelved. We made it! Woohoo! I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley, back with your bi weekly dose of bookstore love. If this is your first episode, welcome! Every two weeks, I introduce you to an independent bookseller in conversation with one of their favorite authors. After an entire year of listening to the podcast and loudly declaring herself its number one fan, I'm pleased to say that our bookseller this week is Emma Straub. Hi, I'm Emma Straub. I'm a novelist and the owner of Books Are Magic in Brooklyn, New York. Emma is in conversation with one of her favorite authors and friends, who also happens to be a former bookseller herself. I'm talking, of course, about Jamie Attenberg. Hi, I'm Jamie Attenberg, and I have written a bunch of novels, and I have a new memoir coming out. Settle in as these two talk about how their book-selling pasts inspired their writing and their love of books. And stick around for my outro if you want some teasers on who might be coming up for the rest of this season and some other exciting things to look forward to. I'm really excited to be doing this and because Miss Shelved is my literal favorite podcast. I'm not just sucking up. I listen to every episode and I'm excited in particular to be doing this with you because you and I met, I think we were both working at bookstores when we met. Mm -hmm. I know that when we met, you had already published some books, but it was like right, right, right at the beginning of my writing career and my book selling career. And so I just, I feel like I've known you for my entire professional life. And because of that, reading your new book felt just, just incredible to me. Like I thought it was so moving and so vulnerable and so honest. I just loved it. And I feel like it, it's kind of like, you know how when you're a kid, you like know all of your friends' parents <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, like every single thing about them. But then with the people you meet as a grown up, it takes much longer to get all of that information. I feel like reading your memoir was kind of like a crash course in like inner Jamie for me. <laughs> yes. Everything you need to know in one handy resource. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing you were interested. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, I remember you as a bookseller and I remember your first book, Flyover State, which I still have. <laughs> which was great. And I even remember that you sent out this email to a couple of people asking us, like, submitting title ideas <laughs> to us. Do you remember that? <laughs> and you were like, I'm thinking it could be one of these four. What do you guys think? And I was like, I'm so, it was really, really sweet. And, um, but the flyover state, that was actually the best title of them all. So. Yeah. Book selling is wonderful. I talk about it a little bit in the book, but I think it really changed my life as I imagine it changed yours yeah, too. Yeah. So, so why? Like, okay. So, I mean, I know some of the answers, but just for the misshelved listeners, tell me about your career as a bookseller. Well, first I want to say that my parents were in retail and my, I know sewing, a sewing store, they own a couple of sewing stores and then it was just one, but they had it for a really long time a couple of decades. And so I grew up in retail and have an, a natural inclination towards that. And the place that I was at in my life when I started working at Word in Greenpoint is that I put a couple of books out and my career really wasn't doing very well. 
and I think that you have can understand this, that sometimes you can get occupied with the numbers, right? <laughs> and, the, and the math of it and how you're doing, and I say that in quotation marks. And I, I needed, a, I think when I started in the bookstore, I felt like I was returning to roots in a way. Mm. It was just talking about people who loved books all day long and just sharing what you love about books. And, you know, hand selling is kind of when you, when you give someone a book and they buy it and they come back the next week and tell you how much they loved it, there's no better feeling <laughs> than that. That is like an incredible, magical moment. And so it just started to feel really pure for me again. And I remembered why I love books and it became less about the business side of it for me, um, which was, I, I just think it's inevitable. It's really hard to like, just make your art and walk away from it. I mean, I, you can do it, but I was interested in making at least a little bit of a living off of it. And, and really any kind of living you can make, if you're not like in love with what you're doing, it's not worth it. Yeah. For sure. For sure. I mean, but what you said at the beginning there, I thought was really interesting, which is that it felt sort of like a, a familiar zone because your parents had a store. And I, I think that that's something like, you know, people so often, like once a week, I would say approximately, write to me and say, oh, I love books. I'm thinking about opening a bookstore. What should I know? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the, the first thing that I say when people ask me <laughs> if they should open a bookstore is like, okay, great. Um, you love books. That's terrific. But like, do you understand that you're talking about like a retail space? <laughs> Yeah. That is that is open to the public, and you know, obviously, you can decide what kind of a store you're going to have, what kind of a space, what kind of hours, what kind of days, all that. But like, if it's your full time job, mm. like, I mean, it is so life consuming to have yeah. a retail store, and I think that a lot of people like me who are like. Yeah, I have some experience. I'm going to open a bookstore um without having like real retail managerial skills um mm -hmm. that all of a sudden you're like, "Whoa. This is a whole You've had other to learn how to do bag it. of bananas." Yeah. I mean, when I was growing up, there was a little bookstore. I wish I could remember the name of it, but it was mostly a secondhand bookstore and every book was like a quarter. <laughs> I don't even understand how they were in business. Like it seemed like they were just kind of hanging out and here were some books or whatever, but those kinds of stores, you have to have kind of, I'm guessing like really cheap rent or you own the building or, you know, you've got money already. And if that's the case, then go ahead and open that, that business for yourself. But I think, especially in a city like New York, you've kind of got to play to win. Yeah. 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 I mean, for, for sure. And I think that like, I'm still understanding that a new <laughs> because it's not just you it's that you want to pay the people who work for you well and you want to treat them right and you want everybody who's involved with the business to be able to be successful in their own way exactly. so it's, i'm sure it's a massive responsibility you yeah. just wrote a piece about oh uh, right yeah i wrote a thing <laughs> maybe five years ago for this this very cool travel guide company called Wild Sam that was doing a Brooklyn guide. And the person who was editing it asked me to write something about Book Court, which I no longer worked at, but I still loved and I still lived close to. And <laughs> I wrote, like, it is horrifying. It's actually, like, horrifying to me now what I wrote because it was, like, so personal. This is actually something that I really want to talk to you about, Jamie, is like understanding how much, like how much to reveal and how much of your story is your story because you were there and it's coming from your point of view and how much belongs to like the other people who were there and like whose point of view do you take into account? Um, but so I, I wrote this piece that was like, for me, very revealing about other people's lives, about the family who owned the bookstore. And I, and it was like, it, it was a very loving portrait. Like it wasn't even that I was 
saying things that were really critical. I was just being, I think, more honest than I might have been in writing about like someone else's <laughs> business. Mm -hmm. But then a travel book company wanted to update it. And so I was like, hold on. <laughs> the whole thing is about like how much I hope book court never closes and never goes away. And in the intervening years, book court closed. And then I opened my own bookstore. So I wrote a little update. And I mean, That's it's great. really nice. Like this woman wrote me the other day and, and said that she lived in Cobble Hill where Books Are Magic is. And that she had recently moved to DC and that she, um, you know, at the end of my little update, I say, you know, <laughs> basically my goal is just that someone loves books are magic the way I loved book court. And the woman was like, I loved books are magic Aww. and I really miss it. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I sent her a present in the mail because I'm a totally normal person. <laughs> Um, yeah, I want to go back to something that you were saying about the bookstore and your writing life, because I don't know if you feel this way, but like, I feel like without a doubt, I would not have the publishing career that I have without my time at book court. And now books are magic. Because you have an understanding of how it works or because of, you have an understanding of what people like or are interested in? No, no, not even. Like literally because I, I feel like working at a bookstore in New York City in those oh, years yeah. put me in the room with, mm. with you and with Alex Chi and with like all the mm. editors and like that I just met everyone. I met yeah. everyone. And like, I don't want to turn this into some like MFA versus NYC kind of thing. But I think that for me, the bookstore was a, a place where I could be a sponge and like, yeah, just learn everything. Do you feel that way? Especially if you worked at then, mm -hmm. right? Because that's when everybody shows up. Yeah. And also you're really kind of getting like, a master class, depending on who it is, every single time, because you know you can ask questions of these real writers, mm -hmm. and they'll give you real answers about how they did what they did. And so, it, I mean, that's maybe not MFA versus NYC, but and in, in NYC, everybody comes through. And if they don't live in NYC, they want to come through NYC. Yeah. And certainly at the bookstore, I met a lot of people in that way. I I really think. I agree. I think the bookstore you worked at, more people were coming through there than the bookstore that I was working at in Greenpoint. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it's maybe a neighborhood thing. But I actually really treasure the friendships that I made with the people who work there. Because they all have gone on to do incredible things. Not that working in a bookstore isn't an amazing thing, but it's like they really are doing really cool stuff. I will just always send them my books to read and always ask them questions and take their advice all the time, like how things are out. Because especially during the pandemic, you're like, I have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I had the luxury of just sitting in my house and writing instead of like having to be out there, you know, problem solving in the ways that y'all have had to. And I think it's back and forth too. Like they'll ask me questions about how a writer would feel if I did this or, you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like we're all excited to know each other and we all have this shared passion for the same thing, which is books. But not only that, like the importance of community, yeah. the sense of community. So it's always really positive conversations that I'm having with the people that I, you know, I'm, at this point, I've known them for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm guessing is how long I've known you. Though, yeah. Too. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think, yeah, 10 years. Wait, I want to switch gears because I came all this way to meet you. Is your first full length book of nonfiction. Like, obviously you've written tons and tons of essays before mm -hmm. over, you know, the last 15 years. But when did you know that you were ready? I mean, it's true for novels also, of course, that you have to have gotten to whatever place it is in your life and you have to gone, have gone through whatever it is in order to write the novel that you're writing at that moment. But with this, 
I just, I want to know how you figured out that you were ready to write this book and it was time to write this book and that you wanted to write this book. All right. Well, I, there's a couple answers. I don't want to ramble too much about this, but I'll try. I would say one thing was that I knew I was about to turn 50, that it was coming up. And it's always felt like a significant age to me, more so than 40. And I felt like I had enough space between me and some of my life that I would be able to write about it well and like write about it from a wiser place. Yeah. So that was part of it. Um, part of it was that there's a chapter in the book that I probably worked on for four years mm -hmm. and I was just writing to get it out of me, which is the chapter that's called a trip to the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to write it and get it right tonally right and really even understand how I felt about everything that was in it and when I got it to the place that I wanted to get it to I was like well no one's ever going to publish this on its own like it just didn't <laughs> feel like it could be it I just wouldn't know where I would want to place it mm -hmm. you know and then it's there was part of me just thought you should probably just write an entire book around it mm. just so that chapter can exist in the world so I think that was part of it I don't know if I was super conscious of it at the time, but I also knew that I didn't want it to go away. It just was really insisting to me, you know, when you have a piece of, maybe you write like a character that you don't know what you're going to do with them yet, mm -hmm. but they're like, you know, I'm here. You know, they're sort yeah. of like, they've got their like arms crossed and they're like tapping their feet impatiently at you and they won't shut up. And so that was like this part of my life that wouldn't shut up. And so I think that that was that was part of it. One of the titles of it actually at one point was A Trip to the End of the World, but then the book became more than just that. So, um, and then I don't know, I didn't, I'd written so many freaking books, like novels. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think I'd hit a wall, but I needed to stretch myself in a different direction. And writing a memoir was the way to do it. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Never do it. No, I don't. Okay. I don't want to say that because it's good for some people, but it was very. It was really hard, and I don't think that there was ever a moment of catharsis for me. And that wasn't what I was trying to get at. I just wanted to tell all these stories that I had to tell. So it wasn't that. It was just you actually feel, you know, the pain yeah. that you went through, and even if it's ten years away or twenty years away, it's still it's still there on the page. That said, there's like happy moments that I'm writing about too. But you carry the weight of all, when you're writing a novel, and maybe you will agree with this, you carry the whole book with you for a while, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Like for as long as it takes you to write it, it's like in your head and you're moving chapters around. You feel it, yeah. you know, but it's also like, it's not you. Yeah. But this was like, it's me. Yeah. Whew, God, it seems so much harder to me, like a hundred times harder to write something that is so personal, even though like, I feel like certainly with my new book that's out in May, this is very, very, very true. Like I'm on every page, you know, like I'm in every yeah. character, I'm all over those books, but I'm also not like the characters are me, but they're not me. And I always have like a safe place to hide if I feel like I need to hide or just, you know, I don't feel exposed. Yeah. I, I think my attitude was like, at some point I had to treat myself like I was a character mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and make certain decisions about what I was wanted to reveal and what I didn't want to reveal. So the book, I think it's like 72,000 words. The first draft was 92,000 wow. words. Wow. So my editor, Helen, and I just decided I was going to write over. I don't usually write over. I usually write pretty much on the money and then maybe I have to add a little bit. And in this case, I had no idea what it was going to be probably until the fourth draft. I knew what the stories were. That I knew, but it was like, how do I carve it out? How do I craft this thing into a, a cohesive work? What are the spines to it? what are the through lines to it that are important and, and making sure that like every chapter sort of connects with one of those through lines. That was part of the revision process more than anything else. There's also like a, a collage effect to it that no one would ever really know unless, unless they had read everything that I've ever written, mm -hmm. which is that some of the chapters are like five essays in one mm -hmm. that I've just gone through 
and chosen a paragraph that I like or a sentence or an idea or a moment and, and packed them all into one, which I'm really interested in that kind of kaleidoscopic vision. But how do you do that and then make it into something that feels really readable yeah. and makes sense? It was really quite challenging, but I think that I, I don't know if any of my other novels I can so clearly point to, oh, I really grew, grew as a writer mm-hmm. in really specific ways, maybe with the middle themes. But with this, I can see like where I stretched and how I pushed myself because I was doing something that was really different. Yeah. So in that way, switching genre, I would recommend it because it's cool, kind of cool what you learn, you know? I would also argue, I'm curious to hear if you agree with this, but I would argue that you are in sort of a special genre here, which is that it's a memoir about your life obviously, but it's also the real look at creativity and writing and I think is going to appeal to to so many people who don't usually read memoir. Like I think that you have two full audiences ready and waiting for this book. And I think it's really true. Well, that's really nice of you to say. Thank you for saying that. You're like an incredible reader and writer. And so- Thank you. You're you're welcome. You're welcome. But 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 I think that like part of it, I imagine that part of this book. Let me actually ask a question. How much of this sort of voice and the thinking about writing also come out of your newsletter that you've been working? I don't know how. When did you start it? Yeah, yeah in its current incarnation, about a, it's like about a year ago. Oh, okay. I was. Re- writing it as I was writing this book. And it sort of became a helpful way for me, this newsletter that I have called Craft Talk. It became a helpful way for me to track my process and to hold myself accountable for what I was doing in this work. And I sort of engage with the questions of writing a memoir while I was going through it and hoping that it would be helpful for other people who were going through the same kind of thing. I'm going to be honest with you, Emma, that when I was done, my editor came back to me and said, you need to put more stuff in about writing. (laughs) (laughs) Like meaning not the writing itself, but the, but the kind of stuff that I talked about in Craft Talk, which had not been a thing that existed when I sold the book. Like I didn't have that newsletter. And I think, I believe that I was writing the book in that newsletter. Yeah at the same time and didn't realize that I was doing it. And that's how good my editor is. And she was like, <laughs> we want more of that. And we kind of went back and forth. Cause I was like, the thing about the newsletter is like, in my mind, it could be better, right? Like I like it, but I know that if I spent more time refining the sentences and you know, like I, I spend the morning writing them usually some of them longer because I suddenly like land on a really big idea and I just want to keep chewing on it and it feels good. And so I let myself do it, but I don't have a lot of time to do it, you know, but there was something that I was working out when I was doing it because I was processing writing. Yeah. And she just, she initially was like, maybe you could just have a, a letter at the end of every chapter. And I was like, no, I don't like that. We always have a moment like this where she'll say, I think it needs to be this. And I'll go, that is totally wrong. And (laughs) there's no way I'm going to do it that way at all. And then I sit with it for a day and I go, even though I don't like her suggestion, there's something that needs to be fixed here. Mm -hmm. So I I need to figure out the way to do it. And so there are like a lot of moments now in the book that are really just me kind of like riffing on writing and being a writer that are different than the rest of the story. And that was a really collaborative process where she, she just basically went through the book and like, said, how about right here? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about this section a little? Can you riff here a little bit more? Mm -hmm. And some of them I said yes, and some of them I said no, but it certainly made the book stronger. I was really lucky that I had that person in my life who really genuinely loves my writing. So she's like, going to read my newsletter too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's not just going to like read whatever I'm sending into her. She's like, I'm interested in what you're thinking about while you're writing this book. And by the way, this is pretty good stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is really good stuff. And I don't see the stats on your newsletter, but as a reader of it and as like a member of your online writing universe, it's really popular. People love it. People love it. And people get so much out of it. It's wild to me 
this because it always feels like really obvious stuff that I'm writing but then it's like sometimes people just need to hear the obvious thing and then there's like all different levels of people who read it like some people are you know published authors like yourself and some people are just starting out and it's genuinely like the purest and most delightful thing in my life Mm. to do it it makes me feel so happy that people care and that I can help people in like a really simple kind of way but it's such a surprise to me because I definitely like stuck up my nose in a newsletter (laughs) you know like because it always feels like oh it's the same content but in a different form you know having done blogs and all this kind of stuff but I think it's about getting the letter in your inbox that makes it feel personal yeah but I also think that there are those of us (laughs) who like really remember when everybody had a blog and like Mm -hmm. I loved that period I loved that period I would read everybody's blog and like you know, I'm so glad now to be in a place where so many writers are just so generous with yeah. their time and their brains. Because I think that I've always really enjoyed social media. Like, I think you and I m- sort of met or connected on Twitter first. Um, yeah. You get a genuine you get a genuine pleasure out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But like Instagram and Twitter, like they both, like it doesn't always feel good anymore. Certainly those places. But like if I am reading someone's newsletter nowadays or writing my own, like I, I get so much, it's like pure pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I, can I ask you, cause I love your newsletter, which I've told you before, and <laughs> it's such a good place for you and you get really excited about it. And that's like, you're someone who is like a professional enthusiast. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you are so good at like being excited about things and getting other people excited about things. Tell me what your relationship is with your newsletter now. Do you, are you enjoying doing it? Do you feel like it's a long yeah. Thing or yeah. I mean, I think it's really fun. And I, I like that I have a space where I can be like fully goofy or depressed or funny or whatever, you know, like that, that it, it, it's not, you know, <laughs> it's funny when I started the newsletter, I was like, I just need a like a newsletter. My mother forwarded me Louise Penny's newsletter that she gets Mm. before I started mine. And it was just like an update, basically, of what Louise Penny is writing, what Louise Penny is promoting, any sort of movie or TV stuff. You know, like it was really efficient. And I was like, that is exactly what I need. That, I'm going to do that. And then, of course, I like open a newsletter document and I'm like, blah, 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 and like making jokes about the new kids on the block or whatever. Like, I just like, I'm always going to be me. And it's nice. Like, it's, you know, I thought I was going to do one kind of thing. You can only be you. You're, you, it's like, it's just a, your fingers are an extension of your soul. And I think it's for the writers that are doing it. And everything that we've talked about so far, it's all about building community it's all about connecting with people yeah. it's all about like how do we reach out to other people I don't think this is a cynical thing to say because we're real people who we make a living at writing our words down and and you know we're very lucky that we get to do it that way so there is like a side of it where it's like this is how I can get fans to you know connect with me or I can promote you know pre-sales of my book on this or whatever it is but at its core, if you're cynical about it and you don't have like a kind of true intention about it, the reader knows. Yeah. They, they can tell when you're faking it. I, it's sort of like whenever you see an author who's been like <laughs> shoved online by their publicist <laughs> and they're just miserable and you're like, it's a, you might as well just not do it. Yeah. Like it's not for everybody. But if you have a genuine like love for the medium, I think it's as long as it doesn't take over your life, I think it's a really good place to be. Yeah, I agree. So are you going to go back? Are you writing a novel or are you writing Jamie Attenberg, My Memoirs, Part 2? What? No, there's no part two. <laughs> that is part two, my friend. I, I'm doing a novel. I have like 30,000 words in the novel, but they're a mess. 
but I'm just trying to get to know the characters right now. It's due at the end of this year, like a pretty tight draft. I have to finish promoting this book, which used to be like two or three months of your life, but in <sighs> the current time is the, you know, a month from now. Yeah. But my novel, I don't have a title for it, but I'm going to write about, I'm writing about women who love their work. Mm. Oh my God. Wait, did you watch Dag in the movie? Sorry. Everyone needs to watch The Lost Daughter. That is the, so good. the Maggie Gyllenhaal adaptation of Elena Ferrante. And one of the stars of the movie is Dagmara Dominchik, who is also a novelist who Jamie and I know because she's very good friends with Christine Honorati, who owns Word and Greenpoint. And Dag is so good in that movie. Man. Wow. I didn't even recognize that it was her. I didn't even know. I was like, that person looks so familiar. And I couldn't figure it out. Her accent was so good. Yeah. Everything about, I guess maybe because she was pregnant in the movie, mm -hmm, but like, mm -hmm. I'm not giving anything away by saying that. Yeah. Um, but she was, she was impeccable. And I, I, I tweeted about this. I was like, oh, thank, thank you for making a movie about, you know, Olivia Coleman is, is basically me. If I like chosen to have children and resented it every step of the way. Yeah. Cause she's really into her work and like being herself. And um, although I don't know, being a bad mom, that's probably not great. Right. Well, but, <laughs> but it's like, I don't know. I loved it. I loved it because like, you know, most of the time I feel like I'm a good mom, but even so, mm -hmm. I am also a woman who very much loves to work and who gets really angry at my children sometimes. And I just, I loved it. I thought it was an incredible portrait of a woman having all kinds of experiences that I have never seen in a movie before. No, I read the book too. Uh, I didn't read it. Should I read it? Yeah. I mean, she's, it's one of her short ones, yeah. I think. So like, I always recommend her short ones. Like, it won't take you very long to do it. But I think that as an adaptation, it felt different to me. It yeah. really did. In a good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really great. Yay. See, so look at look at us, Jamie. We're recommending films. We're, yes. <laughs> we're, we're, we're interested in all choices. kinds of things. I know. I think are we talk, I guess we're talking about book selling. I mean, I, I fantasize still about opening a bookstore in the... Um, not in the way that you, when you sometimes get c contacted by people, mm -hmm. in a pretty realistic way. Yeah. And actually, Hannah from Loyalty and I have, have been plotting doing a pop-up down in New Orleans forever mm -hmm. and ever. Like, we were going to do it uh, fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. Like, we started talking about it in January of 2020. I started looking at spaces that we could do it in for a month. We were going to do it the election month. And we were, like, going to get, you know, apply for grants so we could yeah. find writers in and, like, have it be this kind of political thing, too. And obviously what happened happened yeah. but i still think that i someday will have a bookstore in new orleans and i will try not to ask you for too much advice oh my god i'll talk to you forever <laughs> about everything jamie <laughs> okay we are like really pushing the limits of michelle i think i want to be good i don't want to get in trouble yeah. with nicole nicole has a sword i don't know if you've seen pictures of nicole's sword jamie <laughs> but she has a large sword. <laughs> so with that in mind, I just want to say thank you, Jamie, for talking to me. And this was wonderful. You can find me at Emma Straub, literally like anywhere. If you just type Emma Straub into anything, you can find me there on all the places. Well, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to do this and for Nicole for having me also. I really love this. I love this conversation. It's probably the most time that we've had to talk to each other in two years. Yeah. So I guess this is the way we have to do it on a podcast. Emma. <laughs> oh, and my bookstore. Yeah. yeah. Books are magic at books are magic BK on all the places. Books are magic is good online, but I think Emma's better online. <laughs> um, and online, I also Jamie Attenberg at all the places and then I have Craft Talk is my newsletter. And then once a year, sometimes a couple other times, I do A Thousand Words a Summer, which if any of you out there want to write a book or anything, any kind of writing thing and want to join a community for two weeks, we all just write A Thousand Words a Day. And there's all these great letters from other writers encouraging you to do it. Sounds good. Yay. Thank you for listening, everyone. I love Michelle.
That brings another chapter of Miss Shelve to a close. And I promise I didn't threaten Emma with my sword. That is all her own idea. <laughs> Big thanks to Emma and Jamie for joining us, to our technical editor, Rebecca, for making them sound fabulous, and to all of you for listening. We have an amazing season ahead of us. Science fiction and fantasy fans will definitely want to tune in next week. Let's just say that the episode's theme is Jade. In the meantime, if you like what we do, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. Drop us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and now apparently Spotify if you want to help us find new listeners. You can also share about this podcast on your own social media. We are on Instagram and Twitter at Pod. You also don't have to do any of those things. I'm just really happy you're listening. But if you really, really like what we do here, make sure to join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash anybrinkley for early access to episodes, as well as some other really cool perks. And if you're an independent bookseller, keep an eye on those social media pages for some fun opportunities to join us here on the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. See you in two weeks, and until then, happy reading.